My goodness, the Los Angeles Clippers have been playing out of their damn minds lately. But what if I told you that they're about to get a whole lot better with one secret move? Stick around to find out what it is. The Clippers have surprised everyone this year after the James Harden trade. And the crazy thing is, no one, especially sports analysts and media members, thought it would work. Hell, even Kyle Kuzma, of all people, came out and said he didn't believe it would work. Yeah, maybe he just needs to stick to his wild choice of clothing rather than spitting out wild takes. But all jokes aside, I don't think anyone was actually personally against this Harden and Clippers partnership working just because they disliked James Harden. It was just due to what we've seen in the past. Super teams have failed time and time again over the past several years. Years. However, it's apparent that this isn't the case with this particular super team. James Harden is the system. The Clippers will only go as far as he takes them. He's averaging 17 points and 8 assists per game while shooting over 45% from the field and 40% from 3 on 6.5 attempts. Now, is he putting up 30 plus points like he did in Houston? Obviously not. But I can make an argument that this version of James Harden is more beneficial for the Clippers than prime James Harden. The reason being is that current James Harden is a lot, and I mean a a lot more team oriented as far as getting guys involved and not having to ISO players like 95% of the game. Now sure, Houston James Harden was an incredible player to watch. He was a perennial all-star, a scoring champion, and a player capable of dropping 50 points on any given night. Houston revealed the individual talent of their star, but as the seasons unfold, an undeniable truth began to surface. Harden's greatness as a scorer did not necessarily translate to team success. The Rockets, under Harden's leadership, became synonymous with a style of play that revolved heavily around isolation basketball. The term iso ball became inseparable from Houston's identity. And while it showcased Harden's one-on-one -on -one ability, an ability so great that some of the best young scorers in the NBA today try to mimic it, it raised questions about the team's ability to contend for championships. The isolation-heavy offense, centered around Harden's remarkable ability to handle and shoot the rock, often left teammates as mere spectators, often just standing in the corner, staring at Harden dribble out the clock for 24 seconds. While Harden's scoring numbers were gaudy and his highlight reels were reminiscent of that of Michael Jordan, victories in the postseason remained elusive. The Rockets found themselves facing tougher opponents in the playoffs, and the isolation-heavy approach seemed to hit a wall. Critics argued that that style of play, focused on Harden's isolation exploits, made the Rockets predictable and easier to defend in playoff settings. Opponents devised defensive schemes specifically aimed at containing Harden, knowing that disrupting his rhythm could disrupt the entire Houston offense. The narrative of Harden's greatness as a scorer contrasting with team success reached a pivotal moment. The Rockets faced tough playoff losses, and questions about the sustainability of the ISO-heavy approach became louder. Harden, to his credit, shouldered a significant offensive burden, but the team's inability to advance deep into the playoffs prompted discussions about the need for a more balanced offensive system. As the seasons progressed, Houston attempted to adapt its style, bringing in different coaches and complementary pieces to support Harden. However, the challenge remained. Now that he has Kawhi and Paul George, and Norman Powell, who's a solid role scorer, he can take his time and just play within the flow of the offense and no longer feels like he has to score 50 to win, which is terrifying if you're the opposing team. You never want players who have Harden's ability to be comfortable. The game is already easy enough to him as it is. Now it's even easier. He's picking apart teams efficiently. That 40% from three on six and a half attempts is a game changer. This team is the definition of pick your poison. But while his shooting has been elite, his playmaking and facilitating is what undoubtedly took this team to another level. We all knew since PG-13 and Kawhi landed in LA they would need a true point guard. After many failed point guard experiments, they have finally found their guy. And I don't think people truly understand how easy elite facilitators make the game for their teammates. It's kind of like when you were in school doing a huge project and you had the extremely smart kid doing all of the work while all the other kids had to do was turn in the project. It's the exact same scenario. Harden's going to do all of the setting up and making sure everyone's in their correct spots on the floor, and all everyone else has to do is make their threes. And if you're a big man, make your layups and dunks around the rim after Harden sets you up with a beautiful dime. Paul George hasn't been talked about enough either. He's playing the most perfect brand of basketball you could ever ask for from your second option. No, seriously, he's averaging 23, 5, and 3 while shooting over 40% from 3. Impressive numbers. And he's looking more like the number one option this season. He is the definition of a bucket getter. He has one of the deepest bags in the NBA, and honestly, it isn't talked about enough. There isn't a player his height who can dribble better than the majority of point guards in the NBA, maybe outside of Jason Tatum. I once heard someone say that Paul George is basically who 
who Kyrie would be if he was six foot nine, and that might just be true. George's handles are so great because of his insane counter moves. Every NBA player trains counter moves, but only a few are able to translate that in game against elite defenders. He's just in another world right now. It doesn't matter what elite defensive stopper you throw at him, he's gonna make him look silly. His ball handling skills are so elite that he can create tons of separation from any defender. And then you add in the fact that he's a natural born tough shot maker, and he's six foot nine and can see over pretty much any defender in the NBA, and you can see why it's almost impossible to contain this man one-on-one. -on -one. And a side note, I really hate to say defensive stopper in today's game. Sometimes I feel sorry for players like Drew Holiday, Dylan Brooks, Herb Jones, and OG. They literally have to guard the opposing team's best score every single game for the entirety of the game. Just imagine having to guard Steph Curry on a Monday, Shy Gilgis Alexander on a Wednesday, KD on a Friday, and Luka Doncic on Sunday. And having that responsibility for literally an entire 82 games a season, it's just insane. And speaking of defense, George has been an elite defender. He's averaging 1.6 steals per game and getting his hands on a lot of deflections. His size and amazing defensive instincts not only make him one of the most dangerous off-ball players in the league, but also a really good on-ball defender when he needs to be. Like I said, he has been perfect. And you can't mention the words perfect and defense in the same sentence without Mr. Kawhi Leonard himself. The cyborg is doing exactly what he normally does, and that's leading winning teams. He's averaging 23, 6, and 3 while shooting a ridiculous 44% from deep. He's become even more efficient after the arrival of Harden. He's seeing a lot of open catch and shoot opportunities, and even a little more isolation situations in his sweet spot in the mid range, due to the defense not being able to double team him with Harden and George on the floor, too. And then one player on this roster who makes this team a fan favorite is none other than Russell Westbrook. I think I speak for all of us when I say that Russ is happy, we're all happy. The energy he brings on the floor and in the locker room has been contagious. All of his teammates love him. Both Paul and Kawhi have spoken highly about Russ dozens of times in like the last month alone it seems. If anything, this season shows how your mental can affect your performance and total impact on the game itself. During his stint with the Lakers, he was awful defensively and was leading the NBA in turnovers. He rarely smiled in post-game interviews and looked drained out there on the court, lifeless at times. It's a totally different year with the Clippers. He's a much better person on both ends of the floor. And honestly, I don't think I've seen him not smile this season. He is the heart of this team and the franchise right now. Then players like Ivica Zubats and Terrence Mann have been good in their roles. But the Clippers may look to make one final move to basically guarantee a trip to the NBA Finals. It's been reported that they're in the market for a versatile forward or a center to add more depth and reliability. Three candidates that would make the Clippers even better than they are now are Jeremy Grant, Kyle Anderson, and Nick Richards. Jeremy Grant is making a lot of money, so my trade scenario would involve four players to match his salary. Terrence Mann, PJ Tucker, Brandon Boston Jr., and Kobe Brown would be enough to bring him to LA. The the Trailblazers have their guard spots filled with Anthony Simons and Scoot Henderson and Malcolm Brogdon, and their center spot is filled with DeAndre Ayton and Robert Williams when he returns. The wing spot is definitely a spot they could look to add more depth to. As for the Clippers, Grant would be a phenomenal pickup. He's averaging 21 points per game while shooting 40% from three. He would put the Clippers over the top with his shooting, shot creation ability, and versatile defense. Kyle Anderson would be a cheaper option and can provide a lot of what Grant provides defensively, but Grant is a much better option overall. Nick Richards isn't a name anybody is probably familiar with, but trust me, he is a very solid athletic center who can protect the rim and rebound well, so that could be a very underrated move. But there you go, that's why we think the Clippers could be heading for a championship. Do you think they should trade for one of these three players, or do you think they have enough right now to make a trip to the finals? Let us know your thoughts down below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.